All rise. The Court of Appeals Division 1 is now in session. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. I am Judge Faruya. To my right is Judge Campbell, and to my left is Judge McMurdy. And we are here for oral argument in our case number TX22-0004, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe v. ADOR. As you may know, we have reviewed the record and we have read the briefs. We also record and live stream these proceedings. So please give your name and the name of your client before you begin. You have a maximum of 20 minutes per side, although you are not required to use all of that time. We do require you to keep track of your own time, and the clocks on the podium are there for that purpose. But they also include any time that you wish to reserve in rebuttal. You'll have to keep track of that on your own. As I mentioned before, we have read the briefs. We've studied the record. We have visited and conferenced about this case. And please bear that in mind through your arguments. And with that, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Robert Yoder for Ute Mountain Ute Tribe and Weemanooch Construction Company, the appellants in this case. The tax court dismissed this case upon the Supreme Court's bright line test based in the Blaze case. The department argues and the tax court agreed that if the contract is between the federal government and a non-affiliated Indian contractor, the contract is subject to state tax. The department contends that this is based solely on the identity of the contracting parties and that imposing this bright line test precludes relief under any other theory, including TPR 95-11 or Estoppel. We urge the court to reject the reading of both of these, both the reading of Blaze and TPR 95-11. While Blaze establishes a bright line test precluding claims of federal tax immunity, it offers guidance as to whether appellants can satisfy the requirements, or it offers no guidance, rather, as to whether appellants can satisfy the requirements of TPR 95-11. Counsel, TPR 95-11, what is the basis for that authority? I mean, you're arguing as if this is an element with the force of law. Is it a statute? Thank you, Your Honor. TPR 95-11, of course, is an administrative ruling, and under the administrative rules, taxpayers are entitled to rely on those rules unless it is amended, modified, or superseded. Counsel, does that also pertain if the administrative ruling is simply illegal? Well, under the administrative rules, taxpayers are entitled to rely on those rules until modified. Of course, with regard to 95-11, the Department of Revenue had 23 years to modify it if they believed it to be illegal. In this case, that was never done, and in fact, this year, they issued TPR 92-1, which is substantially identical. So the Department must not think it's illegal, or they wouldn't have reissued it again. And, of course, the legislature last year adopted a statute, 42-5122, that is also substantially identical. So at this point, we've got 23 years' worth of history of TPR 95-11, its successor now 92-1, and a statutory iteration of it, all with substantially identical rules that would favor appellants in this matter. I don't know that I'm quite satisfied with where your answer took me. Do I understand you to say that if the legislature doesn't have authority, or hasn't issued authority to the agency to propound a particular tax, to give, in this case, a particular exemption, and yet 
the uh, the agency ADOR propounds a a, a regulation that uh, can be read to uh, to give an exception that the legislature has not enacted. I, am, am I understanding you correctly that your position is that notwithstanding the agency has no authority, no statutory authority to to make uh, an, an exception, no sui generis authority to make an exemption itself, that notwithstanding that, taxpayers can have that exemption, that that's virtuous? Is that is that your argument? Your Honor, my argument would be that the taxpayers are entitled to the relief and to rely on that relief, even if it's not a statutory exemption or the equivalent thereof, which we don't argue it is. Um, then under the Luther case, uh, taxpayers should at least be entitled to plead a claim for estoppel. Um, in the Did you case, plead estoppel in this case? Did you plead estoppel in this case? No, Your Honor. We, we actually requested uh, in the very first response to the motion to dismiss and, and an oral argument. We requested an opportunity to file an amended pleading based on estoppel and explain the Luther case. Uh, Did you submit a, a proposed a pleading along with your motion to, did you make a, a written motion to uh, amend? Your Honor, we, we, we actually made the request in the context of replying to the motion to dismiss. There was not a separate uh, motion for leave to amend. Uh, quite frankly, the, the way the timing of this case worked out was we weren't even aware that uh, there would be Rule 12b challenges, of course, until we received the Rule 12b motion. We promptly responded back saying that, one, we disagree with the motion, two, uh, in the event that uh, the court would agree with the department's position, we would uh, request an opportunity to file an amended pleading. Um, the did, you did you attach an amended pleading for a court to consider? No, Your Honor, not at this time. Yeah. Okay. There's been no separate Rule uh, 15 motion or an attached pleading, but we have we have uh, certainly requested that to the court. And, of course, the court in the lower court's ruling, the tax court uh, denied our request for leave to amend. Um, they denied that uh, based on grounds that we, we believe are not uh, founded. Um, we, we did timely make the request. Um, the request was made, as I said, in response to the Rule 12b motion. The court expressly stated counsel, that... Counsel, you would agree with me that the request made was not in compliance with the rules of criminal or civil procedure, correct? For leave to amend. Well, we requested the court uh, for uh, an opportunity to file a motion for leave to amend. So you... Okay. Which was, in turn, denied due to futility. Uh, the argument of futility. In, in making that, of, of course, that argument, the court noted that uh, we could have conferred following conferring under Rule 12J uh, to file such a motion, uh, a Rule 15 motion. Uh, in this case, as we pointed in our, our moving papers, the, uh, the timing was a little unusual in that the, the uh, motion or the, the conference, the Rule 12J conference, uh, did not take place until four days before uh, oral argument on the motions to dismiss. Uh, obviously, after the Rule 12J uh, conference, uh, there was no time to either brief or respond to uh, a formal Rule 15 motion. Did you file a motion to vacate judgment? Excuse me, Your Honor, I'm sorry. Did you file a motion to vacate judgment? No, Your Honor, I did not. So you, at no point in time is there in this record your proposed amendment which would indicate how, how you relied on this uh, uh, 9511? Uh, no, Your Honor. There's no proposed uh, amended uh, pleadings. Uh, we did uh, cite uh, how we would rely on 95-11 uh, or seek permission to, uh, to plead that case during oral argument. Uh, we, uh, we, as I said, also uh, referred to those arguments in uh, our response to the motion to dismiss. Can we go circle back to Blaze? It seems to me that Blaze is pretty straightforward and indicates that the department that the department is correct in its interpretation of Blaze. I'm I'm, I'm a little confused at, at how you distinguish Blaze. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first, uh, we distinguish Blaze on on, on on a few different grounds. Uh, uh, one, 
We think that Blaze sets an outer limit. It was primarily dealing with federal tax immunity. But Blaze sets an outer limit. It says that states do not have to defend against a tax immunity claim when it's a federal contract. That's sort of step one. It does not, however, and I think the court's very clear in that, and I note that whether a contractor is exempt from Arizona's transaction privilege tax is not our decision to make. That decision rests instead with the state of Arizona and with Congress. So the Blaze case didn't decide what Arizona would actually do in implementing its taxes, whether that's release, leaf, statutory, administrative. It left that up to the state and the department. It just sets an outer limit. So doesn't that mean we look to a statutory exemption? There's a requirement that the taxes be imposed, and you're asking that there would be an exemption. So we'd look for a statutory exemption that would comport with Blaze, right? Isn't that where we would be? I mean... Yes, Your Honor. You have a tax, and you look for an exemption. Which statute applicable at that time gives you an exemption? There's no statutory exemption at that time expressly addressing the tribal exemptions. However, there is TPR 9511, which provides administrative relief, and we're arguing that under the administrative rules themselves, it allows a taxpayer to rely on that. Does the department have in issuing one of these rulings have the authority to create something that the legislature didn't? I think that goes to what Judge Freer was trying to get at, and I didn't hear an answer that really answered that question. Well, there's, I guess, two answers to it. One, when they do publish a ruling, a taxpayer shouldn't have to second guess whether it can rely on the ruling or not, whether that ruling is constitutional or valid. A taxpayer should be able to rely on reasonably the rulings that the department issues, especially one that's long-lasting. So it would be really important for a taxpayer to say, boy, I relied on this 9511, and I would guess you would want to plead that in your pleading. And, of course, we did, Your Honor. The complaint does plead 95-11. Even if we didn't use the term estoppel, we clearly plead in the complaint that the taxpayer relied on 95-11. In fact, I think the pleadings stay rely on it. So we did plead 95-11 clearly. In fact, it was our primary argument. In the motion to dismiss, the department didn't even mention 95-11. In fact, if you look at the motion to dismiss, it mentions Blaze. It doesn't even, I don't think it cites to 95-11 at all. So we did cite to that. Secondly, even in the context of is it statutory, is it administrative, you know, did we rely on it, the other sort of behind-the-scenes analysis is that the department issued that, I believe in part, at least according to the ruling, due to case law. So it was to, not out of an altruistic means of granting relief or trying to establish a non-statutory exemption. It was presumably what the department believed consistent with law. Under Blaze, we think that there's, it doesn't answer the question as to was this type of contract. Just for my clarification, was 95-11 issued before or after Blaze? 95-11 was issued before Blaze and not amended after Blaze. In fact, it's still not amended to stay substantively for the provisions we're discussing today. So if the department is issuing a ruling, as you state, to encapsulate case law, and then there's a U.S. Supreme Court case that basically wipes out some of that case law, whose burden is it at that point in time, the taxpayer who wants an exemption or the department's obligation to change the ruling? We contend that it's the department's obligation, given that the department's own rules state that a ruling and a taxpayer is entitled to rely on that ruling until or unless amended or superseded. So we believe that it's the burden of the department to let the taxpayers know these are the rules that you can abide by. If we tell you that there's relief, you should be entitled to rely upon it. Is TP 95-11, can it be parsed different ways? 
is it not possible to construe that as interpreting that statute as hey it's you know the the exemption is when there's a contract with the the tribe itself and not a fiduciary or a non-indian doing business on the tribe is it not possible to read it that way i think there's actually uh, two separate rules within the confines of 95-11 uh, the one clearly states that that we've focused most on in our briefs that a contract for a tribe uh, is exempt um, the uh, and, and we've called that the non-affiliated vendor rule uh, but 95-11 uh, also has what I've called the tribe or tribal entity rule that simply says that a, tri a, a contracting activity by a tribe or tribal entity, no affiliation requirements, no for or with requirements, simply uh, activities by a tribe or tribal entity uh, on reservation are, are exempt. Um, that separate nature of just that exemption alone, the tribe and tribal entity rule versus the non-affiliated uh, vendor rule uh, has been recognized by the state legislature now. It, it clearly itemizes them as separate rules. 42-5120. Yeah, you're not asking us to apply that retroactively, are you? No, I'm saying that it's at the, the reading of the legislature is exactly consistent with what we're reading now, and the language is identical. So we don't need to apply it retroactively. It's, it's merely identical to the language that was in 95-11 itself. Well, if it was so controlling, why did the legislature need to add it? The legislature purported to clarify the statute. Presumably someone asked them to. Uh, but in the sparse legislative history there is to that statute, of course, the, the one thing that we can glean from it is they indicated that it was a budget-neutral provision. So they didn't apparently believe, at least from a budget impact standpoint, that they were changing anything. It was simply codifying existing uh, rules. The uh, sort of the remaining items then uh, that I would focus on uh, really are uh, that uh, that there is an exception to Blaze. Blaze is not without uh, without limitations. Uh, it does contain uh, 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 language indicating that uh, uh, the result may be different if, uh, with regard to tribal preemption in particular, uh, if the underlying recipient tribe takes an active active role. I know that the department has indicated that that exception, if the, to the extent that they acknowledge an exception, is limited to Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance uh, Act contracts. I'll call them ASDIA contracts. Uh, but the, the Blaze case clearly does not uh, go into that level of detail. To show, there's no indication that they uh, were, were issuing a broad sweeping rule that says the only exception to uh, to when we will allow Bracker balancing or, or preemption analysis is when there's an ISDEA contract. I think it's more reasonable to read the Blaze opinion that the real focus was, was, was when there's planning, conducting, or administering of contracts, that active... But there are no facts to back that up in Blaze. In reading Blaze, they just say, this is the rule. Yeah, actually, in, in, and they, they announce a bright line rule uh, Your Honor, and that, that's correct with regard to uh, extending the New Mexico case for federal tax immunity. And they said they've never uh, uh, you know, uh, applied uh, balancing uh, to override the federal uh, tax immunity doctrine in that context. However, they said that, that uh, they go on then, at, at the very last part of their decision, really, that... Uh, as, as I know you've read, um, uh, that, uh, that that doesn't leave a tribe without options, that a tribe that plays a more active role, that they've got no occasion to determine how that may impact their analysis for tribal preemption uh, down the road. Uh, what we're saying is here we are down the road, and in this case, uh, it's, it's very distinguishable from the facts in Blaze. I know that, that the department argues that Blaze is materially identical uh, not really, not really the case. This, this, in this case, we deal with uh, federal trust responsibilities. We deal with uh, tribal uh, core sovereign resources, land and and and, and water resources, and the preservation uh, of those assets, uh, core assets for the, for the benefit of, of of the tribes. In Blaze, we dealt with a federal road, 
you know, that was equally usable by tribes and non-tribal members uh, alike. Uh, uh, you know, run-of-the-mill contracts, federal contracts, we wouldn't argue that that uh, a, a contract... I thought Blaze was also for some of the, the tribes' roads. It was, I mean, they're, you're clearly correct. They're, they do reference that there were some of those roads would be used for both. But it seemed like in reading Blaze that where some of those roads would be more for just the tribe. Oh, sure. Uh, you, know, the, you know, roads going through the reservation, of course, are naturally going to be used more by the tribe than, than non-tribal uh, individuals. Uh, you know, however, uh, the, the real test that, that, that we're uh, presenting is, was this contract for the tribe or was it for the public, for the federal government? Uh, we think Blaze is more like the federal uh, government contracting to paint its office building. Uh, you know, that, that's not a fiduciary function. Uh, tribes couldn't get involved in that. It has nothing to do with preemption uh, or tribal interests. But when a contractor is, uh, is building a dam that affects the entire uh, trust lands and water resources of the tribe, those are uh, fiduciary assets, trust assets, that are clearly the tribe's assets. It's, it's not the same as painting the, the office in the BIA local uh, building. And, and that's a distinction we draw, Your Honor. And with that, I, I see that uh, time is up, but I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, I'm Kimberly Sagan and I represent the Arizona Department of Revenue. This case is very simple. There is a United States Supreme Court case that is directly on point that definitively resolves the issue in this case. In 1999, the United States Supreme Court <coughs> decided a blades construction versus the Arizona Department of Revenue. And in that case, they purposely established a bright line st standard for taxing federal contractors on the reservation. And under that test, you look at who has the contracting responsibility. And if the contract is with the BIA, proceeds are taxable, and that's the end of it. You don't go to a BRCA balancing test, and in fact, the United States Supreme Court specifically rejected doing a BRCA balancing test when the contract is with the BIA. Counsel, can you pull that microphone down a little bit so we can hear you? Thank you. The court stated, we have never employed this balancing test in a case such as this one where a state seeks to tax a transaction between the federal government and its non-Indian private contractor. We decline to do so now. The Supreme Court stated that they only apply BRACA when the test, when the transaction is directly with the tribes on the reservation. And the reason for that is obvious. What is BRACA designed to do? It's designed to protect tribal interests and tribal sovereignty. And when the contract is with the federal government, there is no need for such scrutiny because the federal government is the sovereign. It can protect itself. It doesn't need protection. And this case here is really no different than Blaze. The contracts are with the BIA, by BIA, the proceeds are taxable, and it really is that simple. What of, what of counsel's argument that really the BIA was only acting in a fiduciary capacity here as a pass along to the tribe? When does, BIA, does that change the analysis? No, it does not. When the BIA acts in a fiduciary capacity, it is not synonymous with the tribe. The BIA is still exercising federal authority, not tribal authority, when it enters into these contracts. And the fact that Congress enacted the Indian Self-Determination Act, which authorizes tribes to take over certain federal responsibilities, highlights the distinction between the federal government and these tribal governments. When the tribes do assert their sovereignty and they take over these responsibilities and they themselves enter into the contracts, then implied preemption principles apply. But when it's the federal government that does so, then it's Congress that can and will decide whether a state tax on its contractor so interferes with, it, with its projects that it needs to exempt them. In the 20 years since Blades, Congress has never acted to, um, to exempt these kind of contracts. Counsel, can we briefly segue into this estoppel argument and the leave to amend? Had they properly pled in the lower court for leave to amend the complaint and attached an actual complaint alleging estoppel? They have not. But had they? 
How would you address it's, that argument? It would not have made a difference. Like I said, there's a United States Supreme Court case that is directly on point. And for estoppel to apply, there must be reasonable reliance. And here there just isn't any. Um, but what, to, what about 9511? I mean, I, isn't 9511 there to encapsulate a bracket? The ruling does not... Um, <clears throat> the ruling is not in conflict with Blaze. It's perfectly consistent with Blaze. And it, all the rulings... Oh, you didn't answer my question, did you? Oh, I'm sorry. I, maybe I misunderstood it then. I said, isn't 9511 there to kind of encapsulate what, what uh, Bracker? It, we, we have a case from the U.S. Supreme Court that says you're supposed to balance. The Court of Appeals in Blaze balanced. The department seeks certiorari, gets the Supreme Court to basically cut back uh, on Bracker. Is, is that the way it worked? The department argued consistently with, with what, in Blaze, with what the ruling says. If the contract is with the BIA... No, you're missing my point. 9511 comes out after Brackert, correct? Let's take it a step at Yes, it's after Brackert. Okay, so Brackert is issued, the department issues 9511. Wasn't 9511 there to let people know, hey, we have this case out there, there's some balancing going on? If the, if the transaction with the tribe. Correct. Well, I think in that case, I think what the department was thinking is that there the interests are so... Um, um, are so strong in terms of the tribal interest that they just go ahead and they exempt. All right, so then the Court of Appeals issues a decision in Blaze, and they balance. They use Brackert to balance, which would be consistent with 9511, correct? I'm talking about the Court of Appeals here in Arizona. Issues an opinion in Blaze that says, we're going to balance, and they, issue a, they do a balancing, and they rule against the department. And your office takes it up, and the Supreme Court says, no, it's a bright line rule, which would be inconsistent with 9511. No, no, it's not. It's not at all. Okay, We're well, seeing it with explain the to me why it's not. Because if the contract is with the BIA, it's, it's, it's taxable. That's perfectly consistent. Those are the facts in Blaze, and those are the facts here. It's not inconsistent at all with the ruling. All the ruling is doing is recognizing the dichotomy between contracts with the tribe and contracts with anyone else, including the BIA. That's all it's doing. And everybody understands that's what the ruling says. This court, in fact, in Luther Construction, which we cited in the brief, this court, at page 609, paragraph 34, specifically referenced TPR 9511 as declaring that the tax, and these are in your words, applies well, to... not my words. The court's words. Thank you. But, counsel, I think you still haven't asked, answered Judge McMurdy's question. You have 9511 kind of codifies what Brackett said. Then we move on to Blaze. Is Blaze consistent with 9511? Yes or no? Yes, perfectly. Because the ruling goes on to say, if the contract is with the federal government, they're taxable. It's perfectly consistent. In fact, and let me go ahead and quote what, what this court said in Luther Construction. It declared that the tax applied to proceeds from federal contracts with non-Indians to construct on-reservation structures for use by Indians. So it's recognizing that when the contract is with the BIA, even if the projects are for the benefit of, of a tribe, when they're signed by the BIA, they are taxable. Not only did this court understand, also the contractor and Luther also understood, because this court recognized that once the department issued that ruling, the contractor began, um, resumed its practice of collecting tax on its contracts with the BIA. So the department in Blaze, told, it's totally consistent with what is going on in the ruling because it's arguing that it's, it's the signer of the contract that makes all the difference. And if the, the contract is signed by the BIA, they're taxable. The federal government also recognized that the ruling um, is consistent with what the department is arguing in Blaze. In Blaze, before the United States Supreme Court, the United States filed an amicus brief in support of the Arizona Department of Revenue. And it also participated in the, in the um, oral argument. And in the amicus brief that the United States filed before the United States Supreme Court, it referenced TPR twice in two footnotes, in both footnotes 16 and 18. So the federal government did not see anything about the ruling as inconsistent with 
upholding the tax in that case. Did, did the Solicitor General in that case advocate for the Bright Line rule that was yes. was adopted yes, by the did. Supreme Court? Yes, yes. And, and, and our briefs are all available on the United States Supreme Court website if you want to go. Oh, no, I realize they're public records. That's why I was, at, but I was asking. So you, you, that the Solicitor General in Blaze specifically argued T, that TP 9511 was there and the court they, they, ref, they referenced it, right. It's in, it's in a footnote. It's not the main part of their argument. The main part of their argument is who signs the contract. So basically, everyone understands what the ruling is doing. It's just, like I said, it's recognizing the dichotomy between contracts are with the tribe and contracts that are with everyone else, including the federal government. And it's for that reason that estoppel doesn't apply. You could rely on what a ruling says. You can't rely on your misinterpretation of the ruling. So estoppel just doesn't apply here. So even even though it, you're, and, and I just want to make sure I'm clear, uh, the pleadings reference reliance, their pleading re references reliance on TP 9511, but they don't plead estoppel. Is that correct? Is that your interpretation as well? In the complaint, no, they did not plead estoppel. But they reference reliance, or they reference the TP 9511. Um, as I recall, the complaint cited TPR 90, 9511. I don't recall whether they specifically said that they relied on it, but I do remember they claimed that they had a cause of action under the ruling for, um, as a separate cause of action under the ruling. And as you recognized, there has to be some sort of statutory authority. The department on its own cannot create an exemption from tax, just like it can't impose a tax. I do want to address one other argument that the plaintiffs brought up. The plaintiffs argued that there's an exception under Blaze for when the recipient tribes um, take an active role in the projects or when the projects are for their benefit. Well, first of all, there's no case law that distinguishes Blaze in that way. Second of all, it completely defeats the purpose of a bright line test because basically what the plaintiffs are arguing, are arguing for are, is two tests. First of all, they want you to look at whether the tribes played an active role and whether they benefited from the projects. And then if that test is met, then they want you to do a second test, the Rocker balancing test. And that is the exact opposite of what the United States Supreme Court said that they wanted to do. The Supreme Court stated that the need to avoid litigation and to ensure efficient tax administration counsels in favor of a bright line standard for taxation of federal contracts, regardless of whether the contracted for activity takes place on Indian reservations. So the plaintiff's position just makes everything very messy. It is not efficient and it's just going to encourage more litigation. The third thing is if you look at the facts in Blaze, they really aren't any different here. And if you look at your opinion in Blaze, which even though it was reversed by the United States Supreme Court, it still it sets out in a lot more detail the facts of the case and specifically what the, the parties argued in that case. And in your opinion, you stated that, the court stated that, Navajo Nation had a roads committee that established priority for roads and road improvement projects. The opinion also stated that the tribes provided all the employment referral services for each project. The opinion also stated that the roads provided access to Indian villages, Indian residences, tribal governmental buildings, and other locations used by tribal members. So this was not some federal project that just happened to cross over the Indian reservation. It was done specifically for the Navajo Nation. So this case is really no different than Blaze. And no. There's no, there's no need to send this case back. Blaze I, I, definitively resolves it. You know, recently, and I, I'm going to, with the, recently the U.S. Supreme Court has kind of changed their focus on uh, Indian jurisdiction, and there's a couple of cases that have come out. Uh, one talking of, and they're criminal cases. I, and I, do you have any position on whether or not they're affecting the jurisdiction of the ability to tax on Indian reservation? Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I think the, I don't think anything has changed as far as as you don't think it has the role in Blaze. I don't I don't see any any erosion of the bright line test in, in Blaze in in terms of those recent cases that have come out. Right, and you're aware of those cases. You, the, the department isn't concerned that it's no. 
Oh, we're not concerned? Okay. And I don't really have anything else unless you have any other questions for me. Nope. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Council. Uh, thank you for your arguments. We will take this matter under advisement and issue our decision in due course. The court now stands in recess.